45 seconds in because disengagement does not mean threatening disengagement and doing it over an infinite time horizon. It means absolutely disengaging both militarily and diplomatically. You say you're supposed to pull out of the conflict. We say you should be doing that and you should be defending that. I'm going to bring you three, two things in this speech. First of all, an argu argumentation about why uh, U.S. engagement in Syria is better for the Syria is better for Syria, and as a result, the larger uh, stability in the Middle East. And then secondarily, why uh, maintaining U.S. engagement in Syria is better for broadly a global world order. But first, some extraneous rebuttal. First, on the model and how infeasible it is and how ridiculous it is. So first of all, leverage to negotiate with Assad, literally A, is not the motion, but B, makes no sense. The second you start pulling out some troops, especially if you're starting with your most militant troops, you lose all leverage, quote unquote, with what you have to negotiate, because they're not going to believe that you actually have any sort of negotiating power. This is just incredibly squirrely. It makes no sense. Secondarily, though, they say the rebels are really bad for radicalizing, and somehow there are magical other rebels who could do the job better. First, on the bad rebels, two things. First of all, we say the U.S. can support and does support certain groups. We don't freely give money and arms to anyone who says they are anti-Assad. But secondarily, even on the comparative, it is much worse on their side of the house, because when the U.S. is involved, they can act as a moderating force to ensure and actually do some kind of negotiating with the rebels to say, if you do these things, then we will stop funding you and we'll fund these other groups instead. This means that even if the rebels are great on our either side of the house, we still think they're fine and they're much worse on your side of the house. They say American support is waiting. We say two things. First of all, fiat power, we're just going to do it, doesn't matter. Secondarily, though, we don't really care about American support because sometimes they want stupid things like Trump. We say there are other things that are probably preferable, like not Trump. Finally, they talk about Yemen. We're not engaged there. It's not a germane example to the round. So, on to our substantive argumentation. First, why are we better for Syria, and why are we better for uh, stability in the Middle East? Before I go into the actual meat of the argumentation at this point, I want to characterize the conflict a little bit better than the shallowness that they did. We think it's incredibly divided, and it's not as if Assad is just beating the shit out of the rebels, that is clearly winning the war. There are foreign sources back from both the rebels and Assad, meaning that neither side is ever going to back down, because they know they're getting support from elsewhere. So that means, even if the conflict isn't ideal right now, it's certainly long-term, because no one is going to give up. So, what is the current U.S. role in Syria? We think there are stabilizing force. They're buying, or they're funding and backing the rebels. We also think we're providing key things like humanitarian corridors and refugee camps for all the civilians who are harmed by the conflict. They seem like good things. This means a couple things that the U.S. pulls out. First of all, if the U.S. pulls out, it makes room for incredibly malicious actors to take their place. They don't care how long term they're going to do it. At some point, the U.S. is gone, and at some point, other people go in. That means then, yeah. uh, organizations like ISIS and other terrorist groups will have unique opportunities to expand their territories and control, which means more civilian casualties, which is obviously bad for Syria, and also no humanitarian corridors to cut back on that and take care of them. It also means that it expands the possibility for countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia to increase their influence in the region, which we think is really bad for reasons I'll get into uh, a little bit later. So first of all, why is the U.S. the unique country that ought to be engaged? We think, first of all, it's the only actor with the capacity to do so, or at least the actor with the best capacity to do so, because it is just one of the most powerful actors in the world, if not the most powerful. But most importantly, and this is crucial, it doesn't have ulterior motives to install a regime that is aligned along Sunni or Shia lines, because it just doesn't care about that sort of thing. Both Iran and Saudi Arabia have direct incentives to do this, and they have competing incentives to do this, which means that there's likely to be escalated tension and violence on their side of the house, and more of the kinds of civilian casualties that the Prime Minister told you are so terrible. But this week, the harms here are very clear. Civilians die, citizens, uh, civilians die, there's a lot of suffering, etc. Second, then, uh, we talked about uh, military disengagement. Let's talk about uh, diplomatic disengagement, which we actually think is crucial and possibly the most important part of the round, which we're uniquely bringing to you on opening opposition. We think the U.S. is really important because it is the only power who can contain both Iran and Saudi Arabia and actually bring an end to this really long conflict. Why is this the case? First of all, the U.S. is an incredibly powerful actor with a lot of leverage over Iran, and secondarily, it has a lot of leverage over Saudi Arabia because it just has a lot of advantages over it, mainly uh, economic ones that involve a lot of trade. We think that the U.S. is the only actor who can bring both of these parties to the table. This means then the only way you're going to get a peace treaty, the only way you're going to able, be able to uh, end the conflict in the long term if you have the U.S. involved and involved in the diplomatic process, if, this, uh, if, you actually, if OG and CG do what they're actually supposed to do in the motion and disengage thoroughly, we lose this possibility. We say that's really bad. It's not your last chance for sure. Yeah, given the fact that Russia is about to sanction, or you know, U.S. is about to sanction Russia over the Sea of Azov crisis, and the U.S. sabotaged the Iran deal, what credibility does the U.S. have as a mediator between those two countries in Syria? So the question is not whether the U.S. is a perfect mediator. The question is whether there's any kind of mediator at all who can do this. And, and secondarily, then, whether international norms get worse on your side of the house to go and get to get into our second point of substantive. We think that basically this is uh, U.S. engagement in Syria is the unique opportunity to contain three powers. Why is Iran coming? Uh, this is this about the global world order. So Iran coming to power is bad for Syria and bad for the world because they support Assad, who's a minority regime, regime, which means they're going to 
to oppress the majority, which leads to increased tension and violence in the region. Similarly, Saudi Arabia is uh, also is on the opposite side, and therefore would oppress minorities in the region, and as a part of their expansionist goal and their strict religious doctrine, they would also escalate violence, particularly along Sunni and Shia lines, which again leads to all the harms we've been talking about this whole time. This would also, in response to the POI, uh, more specifically, actually increase Russian hegemony in the region, because they have a best huge interest in the region, because they are strict expansionists and they want to expand their power. They also have an interest in the natural resources of the region, namely natural gas. This means that it is best for the world not to give power to any of those three actors. And even if the U.S. is an imperfect mediator, international norms and the possibility for any kind of mediation gets worse on their side of the house. Why is this the case? Uh, well, I'll get into that in a, in a second. This means not, no, none of the possibilities on their side of the house are in Syria's or the world's best interest. But importantly, though, remember that no matter how the conflict turns out, whether the rebels win or Assad wins, etc., the U.S. presence is also really important for maintaining stability in the region and thus the world more largely because the U.S. presence would have catalyzed post war <coughs> resolution in a way that wouldn't happen on their side of the house. This means that well, not only do we get the conflict to be more likely to end on our side of the house, we make it more likely that there's long term solvency and stability in the region and the world in the long term. Finally, on U.S. allies and why that's really uh, that, that's important in uh, dealing with international norms. Look, the reason that the conflict has gotten worse recently is because the U.S. is not following through on its promises. They make that worse on their side of the house. Why? The U.S. actively called and supported and encouraged demonstrations in the region for them to stop supporting the rebels, for them to erode international norms of pro uh, promising things, creating obligations for oneself, and then not following through on them. They make that worse. They make it very less likely that anyone will have any kind of trust in the U.S. in the long term because they uh, didn't do this. We think a great example of this, honestly, is when they didn't follow through on when Assad crossed the right line with chemical weapons. That's when things got really bad because the rebels kept fighting because they thought the U.S. would support them, and then they didn't. If you uh, increase that level of mistrust, you increase distrust between the U.S. and other actors and the U.S. and the rebels, which makes it harder to reach any kind of solution on their side of the house. Also, by the way, all your allies and troops in the region will be super pissed if you pull out. Basically, like UK, France, the rest of Europe, etc., have a massive interest in the conflicts because of the potential of refugee spillover. So that erodes international relations there as well. For all of these reasons, incredibly In his book, To Destroy a Nation, the prominent Syrian scholar Nicola Van Dam argues that the Syrian war of today is not Syrian at all. It involves the actors from all around the, uh, the, the region and possibly the world. At that point, when the US disengages, what it means is that those actors do not only gain power, there is no other power like the US to contain them to actually bring them to the negotiating table. This is our thesis. This is what we stand for. First, a, a clarification of the model. Look, the only issue that we have is that their model is unfeasible. If they try to they try to have their cake and eat it too. They tell us that ah, we will tell people that we will threaten them that we're going to disengage unless you fulfill our concessions, but then actually disengage anyway. But the problem is the actors in Syria are stupid. They're going to observe you disengaging and then realize that your threats are actually empty and therefore are not successful at all. We think that they need to deal with the emotion and deal with the emotion that they have. Furthermore, a seven years like, no one can predict wars that, like in seven years, like a seven years disengage periods, we don't expect them to have to be immediate, but we do have to expect them to stand by what they claim. First, what is best for the Syrian people? I'm going to divide the analysis into two sectors. First, in the current conflict, second, in the post-conflict situation. In the current conflict, we think that the United States provides an important role in, for example, safeguarding civil humanitarian corridors and safeguarding refugees that protect civilian lives on the ground today. If they want to play, care about civilians, then we think that creating these safe havens is something that the U.S. ought to do and that's something that the U.S. is uniquely able to do because A, Russia, Russia doesn't care about civilians, B, the rebels and such as uh, like I, groups like ISIS, for example, want to create a totalitarian Syrian state. Iran, for example, wants to impose its own religious agenda. At that point, even in mitigating the harms of the current conflict, the U.S. is necessary. But the second question is what happens in the post-conflict period. Because look, the only solution to a situation in Syria is basically likely to be a, some kind of a peace treaty. The only at least solution we should aspire to. Why is this? First, because we think it's unlikely that any one actor is going to draw, uh, uh, ultimately win this conflict. Why is this? Because, well, as Alex pointed out to you, a lot of different groups 
support different actors. Assad is supported by Syria, by Syria and Iran. Uh, sorry, by Assad is supported by Iran and Russia, for example. Whereas the rebels are supported by Saudi Arabia, which is, by the way, high, which really Point. cares about Syria. A because it expands their ge geopolitical influence, and B because they really don't want to get Iran to, to have more power, and C because of the significant natural resources and the natural gas that Syria has. At that point, the only actor that is capable of putting military and political pressure on all of these other groups is the U.S. because the U.S. is the most powerful. The U.S. can do things like, for example, threaten to uh, to, to withdraw um, aid from Saudi Arabia. It can impose further right. sanctions on Russia. It can impose further sanctions on Syria, uh, on Iran. Recognize that this doesn't this doesn't require past U.S. credibility. All it requires is U.S. current U.S. power. That U.S can say, hey, unless you, you know, unless you come to peace, uh, peace treaties, unless you come to the negotiating table, we are going to do X, Y, and Z. That is the nature and the mechanism by which we are going to get to these peace treaties. But before that, this debate is necessarily comparative. So let's look at the potential other options. We think there are three main ones. First, we think Assad winning wholeheartedly. We think this is bad because Assad, the Assad regime hasn't been a particularly good actor in the past and therefore is unlikely to be such a good one in the future. Furthermore, they have support from Iran and Syria. The second act thing is that the rebels might win exclusively. We think this is also problematic because we think that it's possible for the rebels to, for example, uh, because not all the rebels are good, as they point out, it's possible that the Saudi Arabian supported rebels are the most likely to succeed because the US is no longer supporting the democratic ones, thus they are also likely to create a, uh, you know, a state where um, you know, it's, they, they hurt the minorities. The third actor is that Russia exclusively is the one that mediates the conflict. We think this is also problematic because A, Russia doesn't have a particularly good human and humanitarian record either, and B, we think that Russia mainly cares about natural gas, etc., and supporting the Iran regime. They don't care about things like democracy and freedom that at least we are likely to care about. Thus, even if the worst situation is that the US plays some role, at least it's playing some role in a negotiated settlement between, say, Iran, Russia, and Rebel, it can be the voice of democracy. It can be the voice of freedom that no other act can open. Okay, so the problem is that <laughs> while your solution would be great and while the alternatives are bad, the reality of an ongoing war in which rebels yeah. like cause massive retaliation because the US is backing them mm. is awful, seeing as there's no meaningful win for them and Assad is going so, to win regardless. So, 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 so I, I'm a little confused by this, right? So first of all, we increase the probability that the de democratic rebels win, right? We think that ideal solution is available on our side. But B, the retaliation, we actually encourage the government of, of the Syrian opposition to engage the strength. Because we can tell them, for example, if you use chemical weapons, if you use other forms of problematic forms of warfare, we will step in and we will be the ones to defend you. Because if the U.S. leaves, there is no one to defend them if the Assad, if the Assad regime uh, dramatically imposes their conflict, for example. Furthermore, though, we can also pressure them if we believe that the correct solution is a peace treaty, which we think it is, we are the ones who can actually pressure the rebels because of the influence that we have to come to the negotiating table instead of losing all of any kind of leverage or any kind of control we have over them. Given this, now let me move on to the second main question, which we think is in some ways even more important. Look, in the past, the US has actively promised to be engaged in Syria. Look at Obama's red line, for example. Look at the calls for regime change in Syria and the calls for the Assad regime. Why is this important? Because the US has made a promise of continued engagement and using its rhetoric, and when it then decides to pull out, that rhetoric no longer has any kind of credibility. Why is this important? Because what it means is that when the US in the future engages in kinds of threats against dictatorships, when it engages in or when it calls for regime change, etc., when it supports the rebels, what that means is those kinds of threats significantly become less credible and weaken in their potential power. This limits the US power to influence further future political air situations in the Middle East and the world as a whole because they no longer have that kind of support. Furthermore, though, they tell us that, oh, well, political will in the US is falling for the Syrian conflict anyway. This is false. Look at the reaction to General Mattis' resignation, right? In many parts of the US, people understood the role, that the, uh, the, the importance that the US president had to have, right? We just think this is a fact claim that is false. But more importantly, when our policy, when it's like, it, when we can demonstrate the successes that it has, when we can protect civilians, for example, that kind of success is likely to generate further political will for these kinds of situations. They give you an assertion, we give you an analytical reason for why it's likely that political support exists. Furthermore, the kind of engagement we're talking about, it isn't just military, right? It's things like sanctioning 
same governments were doing problematic things. At the very least, we reduce the harms of the, the type of tactics of these countries and these rebels are going to be used by punishing them. That in itself is a benefit by reducing the severity and the length of the conflict. Thank you. The deputy leader of opposition opened his speech with a quote from a book which said that the Syrian war isn't just Syrian. In fact, it's not really Syrian at all. It's a myriad of actors from all over the world that are trying to exact their interests in this tiny, very complicated space of conflict. Exactly. What we tell you is that American presence in an area where multiple interests are beginning to join and enter into Syria that are conflicting with each other and are pushing across state lines is going to jeopardize creating a space for a flashpoint for conflict that the United States presence in will exacerbate. We're going to give you analysis on how on what is actually happening in Syria and tell you why the, uh, the longer we stay in, the more we jeopardize engulfing Syria into another war that involves not just the rebels and the Syrian regime in Russia, but three different state actors that cannot be in the region all at the same time. All integration, all rebuttal will be integrated, but we're going to take out the LO and push the debate where it needs to be. One point of contention, how America's presence is it's about to become a flashpoint for conflict and crucially why we need to pull out right now. I think there has been some general contextualization of the actors in the region that have been fairly accurate, right? It's been Iran and Russia trying to rebuild the state. It's Russia's interest in the, in the port of Tataris in, 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 in Syria. It is Iran's desire to create an axis of evil against the hegemony of the West and gain influence in the Middle East, which we think they're su succeeding at. It's Turkey occupy, occupying key cities like Afrin and pushing back the SDF back into their corners where they began before this war was started. There are a couple of problems with this that are going to be problematic given you the United States' presence in Syria. The first is that the contact lines for conflict between these actors are beginning to merge. We think that Russia and Iran have been interfering with the United States' no-fly zones and humanitarian corridors, but both states have been set up. There have been multiple, multiple reports multiple reports from military sources that planes have been buzzing over warship, planes that have been buzzing over tanks and buzzing over different artillery pieces, and, and Syrian fighters have not been able to tell the difference between Russian and American aircraft and have almost fired those planes down. We think Iran is pushing back towards places like the Golan Heights and threatening Israel and the United States is being put in a difficult position as to whether or not they are going to remain agnostic or defend their historic, their, their historic ally. Turkey has more than once, Erdogan himself threatened to push past the Syrian Democratic Forces in order to occupy these key cities, even if United States forces, mind you, there are 2,562 of them are in the way. They do not care who they are going through. That's for lots of reasons, right? The United States excuse me, Russia and Iran have a non-negotiable interest in remaining in Syria, regardless of whether or not the United States wants to negotiate their way out, like the, fanta like the fantasy world we get from opening opposition. Not only does Russia have that port there, which historically, because of the last 600 years of Russian history and Peter the Great's obsession with boats and water, is non-negotiable and they're not going to give up that, but I know it's weird history stuff. Point is, Russia has a really strong navy and they like, it, like to keep it that way. Syria is a crucial piece of that history. Turkey is, going, is not going to let Royava become so big that it inflames conflict with the PKK and pushes into the border in the same way that they assisted Iranian forces in pushing back the Peshmerga when they tried to take over Kirkuk in Iraq once they, once they announced a referendum. These are non-negotiable interests for them. Second of all, this is a problem because state, states, state interests are beginning to conflict with each other, right? I've already mentioned how some of these contact points are starting to push back, but this is where the United States gets really important. If Israel continues, if Israel and, and Iran continue firing bullets across the border near the Golan, Golan Heights, which Israel sees during the Six-Day War, the United States is going to have to come to Israel's defense. This was Trump's, quote, red line that he issued to Iran several months ago when this conflict began to inflame. No, thank you. You'll get your chance. You'll get, you'll get your chance later. At some point, the United States is going to have to respond. And if they don't, you get all the impacts about how the threats mean nothing. And if they do, it starts to engulf conflict between the two. We'll tell you the impacts of that later. The same exists for Turkey. We think the Syrian Kurds have been an incredibly important force in making sure that we can combat the rise of ISIS. But two things. First of all, they have been battle tested and trained by United States forces to the point where if ISIS grows up, we think they're willing to combat them back, right? We've got Jordan, we've got Turkey, Iran, Russia, and the SDF. We think if ISIS rises up, we're going to push them back. But also, unfortunately, we just think Turkey is a much more important ally, given the fact that we've been trying to get them to NATO and the EU for a long, long time, and it's not good to have them in, as an as a enemy in the region. Because they're connected to so many places in the Middle East, if we lose them as an ally, we lose 
use our pinpoints for stability. See the bases that we use to conduct airstrikes against ISIS and other and, and enemies of the Syrian Democratic Forces. What are the impacts of this in terms of three different ways as how this mis miscalculations could lead to war? Before I get that, opening opposition is ANSI. Given that all these actors such as Russia, Iran, etc., didn't play any role in Syria besides the civil war, it seems that the, the, their actions are more opportunistic than non-negotiable, as you claim. This is precisely our point. They are opportunistic, but at the point at which the reasons they're engaging in them is because there has been an opening up of opportunity, and now those negotiations are non excuse me, those interests are non-negotiable because they know they're winning, because as you misaccurately characterize, Syria the Syria and Russia and Iran are winning the real the war against the rebels in the same way that we push back ISIS to 99 point percent of territory in the bill we've also pushed back the rebels to 85 percent out of their territory they are losing and miserably suffering and are stuck in tiny enclaves with hundreds of thousands of people in them they're not going to win that fight you pretty you are literally proving that point so thank you three different ways as to how this could lead to conflict or at the very least a, 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 at, the, at the worst war between these states the first is miscommunication this is the most likely scenario right we think that we, we think given the fact that different forces have almost already shot down american planes because they're so close to the conflict points that are being beginning to merge closer and closer to each other. The fact that, that there isn't communication lines between this two, because often states purposely keep them off so they can blame another actor for accidentally shooting down one of their planes. That's how you get, that's how you get like a Russian fighter jet being shot down by American forces, then responding to the United States, or Russia, Iran jumping on board and pushing back into our borders. That's how you get Michigan communication between actors that leads to actual conflict that sparks into war. The second is that you have a man, is that you have a man, is that you have a mandate to defend. As I was talking about, sooner or later, we're going to have to respond and back Israel up because Iran is not going to stop firing bullets into the Golan Heights because they want that region. They wanted it during the Revolution War, during the Iranian Revolution in the 1980s, and they wanted it when when, when Syria took uh, when uh, when Israel took that in the 1960s. Third, the interests are too strong to deter conflict. The opening opposition says, Ah, the U.S. can be a good mediator. They can create pressure to make the rebels do what they want. I give you a POI that said there's absolutely no reason why these actors are going to negotiate with the United States. They're sanctioning them. They sabotage the deal. But moreover, these interests are more more important than any possible negotiation with a side that is literally winning the war in Syria. There's absolutely no diplomatic leverage that the United States has to try and coerce them into doing what they want. Russia has non-negotiable interests and will take those risks to defend their interests, given that there are three states allied on their axis that will defend their interests when they come to, to come a front. They tell you that, that, that this is that this might lead to the rise of ISIS and this might lead to some like 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 bad things in the international community and oh the United States has been really good in the Middle East no the United States has been terrible in the Middle East right they funded all these rebels that ended up taking arms from them and committing, committing war crimes against not only just the Syrian regime but against the civilians there we think that's ridiculous we think Iran and Russia taking over the oh, taking over Syria is a great idea because they're going to fund the reconstruction of the state no reason as to why Russia is bad you just asserted it just because it's a liberal debate community the outcome of this is far more dangerous than Assad rebels or Russian-aligned uh, axis winning the war in Syria. Russia, the U.S. needs to get out now before things get really, really bad and really ugly. Against like powerful states. 
We don't think this is really true, right? Why? We think firstly the reason is that these states clearly do not want to war with the United States, which means that their problems, for example, about miscommunication or about a mandate to defend, or like, no, miscommunication are particularly unlikely, because even if, for example, the United States mistakenly shoots down a plane of Russia, they're likely going to communicate that, right? No one wants nuclear warheads flying about. That is why this kind of miscommunication is unlikely to happen. So we think that it's actually more likely that the kinds of problems that they wanted to talk about, the harms, are going to occur under their side of the house. Because if the United States pulls out, and for example, these interests are so non-negotiable, the Iran will still invade the Golan Heights even if the United States pulls out, which means that the civilians there are going to be harmed. They're going to be killed by the Iranian government. We think that right now the most important role that the United States plays in these regions is as a buffer, right? Because no one wants to risk the role of the United States, like the wrath of the United States and its people by attacking them. That is why these people, these states, even if they're opportunistic and they have non-negotiable goals, do not act upon those non-negotiable goals and enter into these places. We think that that is exactly what prevents the kind of massacres and the huge wars that you guys talked about. If you take away the stabilizing influence, then who knows what happens, right? We think you need to be more comparative in that regard. Let's talk firstly about the Kurds. What is going to happen to them and what is the role of the United States here? We think that the main role that the 2,500 troops that the United States has in the, uh, in the Syrian region is particularly to protect the Kurds and help them train themselves. They do these things, for example, by training officers, providing weapons, providing border patrols for, these, uh, for the region that the Kurdish people control, and making sure that, for example, Turkish states as well as the Syrian government do not enter into these areas and actually harm them, right? We think that the reason that this is particularly harmful if the United States pulls out is because the Syrian government and the Turkish government are probably going to be likely to invade these places and to actively try to take over these regions if the United States pulls out. Why is this true? Firstly, because this is a problem of national identity to both of these governments. So we think that the main incentive of the Assad government right now is to not be happy with the 60% of land he currently controls, but to take over the entirety of Syria and to make sure that they have entire dominion over the land, right? Which is why they're likely to try and attack like the Kurds after they've like had a little more stability within their region. We think secondly, particularly the Turkish government and also the Syrian government to some extent, see the Kurds as a threat, right? They see them as a credible threat to government, which is particularly harmful to them, which is why when they see them as a threat, they're likely to attack. So why is this particularly harmful? Point. Firstly, because there's really no way for the Kurds to retaliate against this because they have a smaller army, they have a smaller population, their weapons are going to be Point. gradually updated if the United States do not get them anymore, which means that they're going to be quickly run over by these people. And this is particularly harmful considering the kind of oppression that these Kurdish people have faced in the past. You've seen the kind of massacres that, for example, the Iraqi state did against them in the 1980s through gas attacks, right? This is likely to happen in Kurd the Kurdish area also because the Syrians have shown they're willing to use gas attacks and also don't see these Kurdish people as a very important threat, which means that you're going to have Kurdish children and women dying as a result of this policy, right? But we think, secondly, the really huge harm is that there are going to be huge casualties and these are going to be the very civilians that opening government really wants to protect in this regard. Why do we actually do that? We think that opening government and closing government as well have been very unclear as to what kind of solution they actually want for Syria and what they envision the end goal to be. We're going to tell you that when Assad does not and should not control the entirety of Syria right now, the most viable solution is the uh, uh, viable solution is federalism, right? It's a kind of partition in which there is an ability for the Kurds to get a, like a significant amount of land that they currently control and the inability of the Assad government to violate this, which would ensure that these Kurdish people who deserve the right to autonomy, who deserve the right to not be killed by a government they don't, they don't, are, they don't really represented by, can be able to live a stable life. So we think that this is more likely when the United States stays in, because the United States, by being a part of this, actually shows that they are an actor involved in this and are able to stand for the Kurds and represent them, for example, on the stage between Russia and Turkey. They are unable to do so if they pull out because they simply don't have any states, so Russia and Turkey are not like, likely to listen to it. Furthermore, unlike what they said, Syria is never going to listen to the United States, right? Because the United States has already shown itself as being opposed to anti-democratic government. Here. It has already attacked the Assad government, which means that the Assad government is going to be disposed against the United States in the first place. Furthermore, there are also other actors that are able to stand as mediators between these states. I'm thinking, for example, about Germany, or maybe the Nordic countries, or EU countries Point. also, that can stand as like mediating states between parties that because they are not really actively involved in fighting, and people listen to them, right? We think that is why it is more likely that we are able to protect these people definitely under our side of the house, while under theirs, you definitely kill them and definitely harm them. That is hugely harmful. Uh, okay. Okay, so it's untrue that the capacity to fight is unchanged, seeing as America, that America is like the only lifeline for the rebels right now. But even still, just engage with our analysis about the massive amounts of future humanitarian crises that the US is the only capacity to intervene in, which is dependent on how history goes down right now. These are massive amounts of lives. So I think the problem with close 
company government is that they're not really compared to them. This is my second assertion, right? We think that humanitarian harms would actually happen more under their side of the house. Why? Because these rebels will keep on fighting. The reason that these rebels will keep on fighting is that they know that there's going to be no justices again under the Assad state. They know that the Assad state has tortured and killed rebel soldiers that it has found within its prisons, which means that it's unlikely that any of them are going to surrender, because if any group that comes out that they were rebels in the first place, they are never going to be protected at all, which means that these people still have an incentive to keep on fighting. But people are going to die either way. First question in, debates, in today's debate. Can the United States take by Syria, engaging a lot with opening opposition, telling you how broad its extension takes that out of the debate? The first thing that opening opposition tells us is that only the United States has the leverage to bring Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia, etc., all these interests to the negotiating table. The first response we get, which was in Robert's extension, is that it's pretty unclear why Russia, Iran, and Saudi Arabia have any like, viability to negotiate as actors. What he gives you reasons why Russia historically does not want to come to the negotiation table, because they have an extremely important naval port in Tardis that the Assad regime allows them to continue, that they have good relationships with Assad, but he also gives you reasons why Iran, Iran would never want to negotiate, because they have religious, like deeply encoded religious and cultural interests in the region. They can't just say, oh, we'll sanction Iran, oh, we'll sanction Saudi Arabia, oh, we'll sanction Russia, because one, we've done these things in the past and it didn't work, but two, we recognize that the trade-offs of these kinds of things are worse, we'd rather have the trade relationships than to, 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 uh, to destroy these relationships. The second response we have is that it's unclear that the U.S. has the leverage to create these kinds of negotiations anyway in the first place. As opening opposition notes in their own argumentation, Assad is still powerful in Syria and perhaps gaining power despite the United States' support for rebel forces. What does this tell us? It tells us that the United States doesn't tangibly have this kind of leverage, that the Russia and Iran backing of Assad is powerful enough to make it feel that the United States isn't this all-powerful actor that they want to make it be. And we think the U.S. has proved unwilling to increase that presence. They have increased the 2,000 troops to 10,000 troops because they're so scared of the kind of flashpoint conflicts that can happen with actors like Russia, with actors like Iran, that they're not willing to increase that presence. Not only do they not have the leverage, even if they theoretically did have the leverage, they don't want to risk some kinds of proxy conflicts and not, uh, worse than what we see even in Vietnam to happen because of that. The opening opposition like backpedals a bit and says like at least we create negative stability because we get prevent power vacuums from occurring. Robert tells you two reasons why this isn't the case. Firstly, because terrorist groups have largely been beat back already. ISIS isn't even in Raqqa anymore, which was historically their home base. But secondly, that interests in the region mean that terrorist forces persist. There's no reason why Russia won't continue to fund anti-terrorist forces if they want the Assad regime to continue to be stable and they see ISIS as a Sunni threat to that Assad regime. We think the very interests that exist in the region besides the United States means that we don't think this power vacuum would legitimately exist. But even if the opposition wants to go on their last stand, which is like the United States creates humanitarian aid, two responses to this. But the fact that Robert tells you that the United States presence perpetuates a conflict and creates a higher likelihood of a flashpoint for more conflict, the United States creating humanitarian aid corridors means they're creating humanitarian aid corridor corridors that are more necessary because of the conflicts that they continue to create. But secondly, Russia does humanitarian aid. Do you not believe opening his opposition's argumentation that the U.S. is this benevolent actor that loves all humans and Russia is this evil actor that has no interest in humanitarian aid. Historically, they have done humanitarian aid in Syria, and we don't think that that's good comparative in today's debate. Secondly, then, should the United States disengage? 
Opening government gives us like a, a, a very simple reason for why the United States should dis uh, disengage, and that's basically this. We're losing. And we think that this, this is a pretty obvious reason because we're not going to get the benefits that we want. But Robert tells you something even more. It's like, not only are we losing, but we have a potentiality to create the, make the region much, much worse if we continue to persist in the region. He gives you three specific reasons and extensions for why this is the case. The first is just a very simple miscommunication that can happen. We saw this already happen with actors like Turkey and Russia when a plane accidentally flew over Turkish airspace and Turkey shot it down. I mean, these kinds of miscommunications can happen where nobody even was involved, but Russia thinks the United States was doing something that ended up bombing, the, the funding group that ended up bombing the Russian, Russian soldiers, and that itself can create tension. But secondly, it's that just like the mandate to defend that exists because the United States is in there, creates a kind of, that could create like a kind of France Ferdinand scenario. That is to say, even if a Russian troop in, in, like, accidentally shoots down a US troop, that that itself creates a mandate to defend that could lead to a flashpoint creating conflict. But thirdly, Robert also tells you how the, just the strength of the interests that exist in the region makes it so that these flashpoints are very possible. It makes it so Iran and, and Russia never want to back down and are more likely to enter these conflicts. We don't think closing opposition's response, which is just that state States don't want war is sufficient. Here, of course here. states don't want war, but wars still happen because these kinds of flashpoint scenarios that Robert told you uh, like happen as well. It's these very circumstances that were created. On to the closing opposition extension then. No thank you. Closing opposition's extension essentially, look, the United States need to remain to protect the Kurds and civilians in that region. Four responses to this extension. The first is that civilians are dying because of the war that the U.S. can't win here, already. Here. That is to say, the war, the civil war between the rebels and Assad that the United States is funding is causing deaths already. So the very protection of the Kurds that they like is killing civilians. But secondly, we would say, if, like, if you believe Robert's extension and those flashpoints are possible, a proxy war between Russia and the United States and Syria would be far worse for the Kurds than any scenario that exists right now. But thirdly, like, what's their end game? Perpetuating a civil war you can't win to create the product of protection forever? If they can't prove that they can win the civil war, are they just going to continue a bloody civil war that kills civilians in Syria and just be like, look, we're protecting Kurds? But fourthly, Robert tells you that realistically, Kurds can protect themselves. The SDF has been, like, they've tra trained them, they give them weapons, and they've become a legitimate military. Here, here. Like, the Kurds have actually come to the negotiation table That's with the Assad regime, here, here. and that means the Kurds at least have some leverage in the region. Go ahead, Owen. If you want the rebels to come to the negotiating table, the only one that has the power to force them is the US because Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and other actors will always continue to support the rebels because they have clear geopolitical interest in the region because they don't want Iran to get to go to power. And by the way, countries aren't dumb enough to do five over five points. So that, that very that very, <laughs> that very that very support that you talked about your point about how Iran and Saudi Arabia are supporting these rebels is the very reason that the United States doesn't have leverage over them. Because it's not just the United States versus Assad or United States versus some rebels or United States versus some Sunni terrorist groups. It's United States versus Assad, which is represented representative of Iran and Russia's interests. It's United States versus Sunni terrorist groups that are representative of Saudi Arabian funding through Wahhabi Sunnism. Like, this is the reason that they don't have that leverage, because it's not just one power versus a smaller power, it's one power versus equally strong power. Then the last question then, what does Syria look like on our side of the house? Because closing opposition, while they don't give us a long-term plan, yeah. thinks this is quite important. The thing we're going to say here is probably concede that Assad comes back to power. Two reasons that we're not substantially worried about this. Firstly, because we couldn't prevent it in the first place. Prove to us how we actually prevent Assad from coming to power. I think our argumentation outweighs you. But secondly, we allow terrible regimes to exist in the status quo because we recognize that at least stability is better. If, if the choice is between letting Saudi Arabia continue to be an authoritarian regime or put, put Saudi Arabia into a terrible civil war that's going to destroy Turkish people for years and years, we would say, let the stable authoritarian regime stand. Very proud.
Two important notes before going on to clutch points. Firstly, they're extremely lazy about the counterfactual. They just assume if the United States withdraws from Syria, the suddenly rebel soldiers are going to give up. Suddenly Kurdish people will just have to stand the kind of oppression and massacres that Assad regime is trying to impose on in these individuals. We don't think that is the case, guys. The continuous uh, bloodshed will still continue, and the thing is that we need to prevent the very like, massive kind of operations, massive kind of like uh, bloodshed happening in there by the United States staying in there and at least having deterrence for other kind of parties like Assad regime, like Iran and so forth, because they're more likely to hesitate to uh, conduct full operations towards these areas where the United States is there. And secondly, we don't have the burden on the opposition to prove to you that we are going to be likely to win against Assad regime. That's the question. But we're going to tell you, no. from, especially from closing opposition, no thank you, is that bloodshed gets far worse when the United States retrieves from that country and Assad tries to take over 100% of the land in Syria instead of 60%, which is right now. We think that prevention of that and continuing to have stable kind of separation of power and separation of land and continuing to like, protect these individuals who are the most vulnerable, including Kurdish people, including rebel soldiers, is the most important thing in this debate. So we don't don't, don't think that we just have to like, win against Assad regime. Okay. That's kind of nonsense, right? And thank you. I'm going to talk about two things. Firstly, is conflict likely to decrease or will it just continue and we just lose protection for these individuals who should be protected? Secondly, what kind of vision should we have in order to like, re like move forward in Syria, right? But before that, lots of engagements to closing opposition, and thank you. Firstly, they talked about misconnection, um, miscommunication. Firstly, you have to recognize that Iran or Saudi Arabia wants to avoid war because they know that they can stand little chance against the United States of America. That's why, secondly, these like, countries are more likely to have some hot lines to communicate with each other. Of course, there might be some like, bombings by really radicalists who just blame the other countries and so forth, but the reason why it does not be become massive operation against one country just because that country mistakenly shot down one airplane is because we do have this hotline, right? And also recognize they talked about, you know, um, non-negotiable sort of actors, especially in this point, they lack counterfactual analysis, right? Like, just because America pulls out from Syria doesn't mean that Iran is going to stop from stop going in Syria, right? Probably Iran will still go into Syria because the best interest is to have control of Syria over the Middle East that they themselves set. And Russia will still get in there because they want ports and so on and all the control. Assad, Assad regime will still attack those civilians or Kurdish people like rebel, uh, rebel soldiers who are remaining in there because he wants 100% of the control of that land. That shows that oppression will still continue. What is necessary is to protect these individuals who are the most vulnerable, who will be harmed under their side of the house because of the continued and sort of radicalized kind of oppression from under their side of the house. Before moving on, uh, Mm, uh, uh, <laughs> we don't have to prove that warheads go flying. All we have to prove is that American forces being caught up due to all these actors enlarges the conflict in a way that previously didn't exist. You're right that the levels aren't going to stop fighting, but the United States being there makes everything worse. Engage in the actual comparative in this debate. Okay, so we have to recognize uh, the, the question about is conflict likely to decrease, right? I'm going to answer that from now. Thank you. So, Opening proposition said that status quo is shit, right? The very casualties are happening. Fine, the thing is, what about on their side of the house counterfactual? We only have, Assad only have 60% of the land, and the rest of that is occupied by rebel soldiers or ISIS or Kurdish people. And Kurdish people and rebel soldiers have a massive incentive and the reasons to still fight back because they just couldn't stand the oppression by Assad regime. And Turkey is still attacking Kurdish people even beyond the border and in, inside Syria. And it's just not likely that they're going to extinguish that fire just because the United States pulls out from that country. The only thing that is likely to happen under their side of the house, uh, sorry, the only like, analysis on the counterfactual um, on the, their side of the house is 
We can negotiate with Assad regime without telling us why that negotiation is going to be actually successful when they actually retreat uh, from that nation. And although they told you rebel people will give up because they, um, you have to recognize this is just an assertion. And secondly, we tell is tell you it's not likely considering the fact that these people rebel, rebelled against Assad regime when it was most unlikely to succeed when the US was not clear on supporting these individuals. And lastly, they were rather radicalized because now they are more desperate because they don't have the support from the United States of America. They are desperate. That characterization was already conceded by their side of the house, which means that the, the consequence they're going to have under their side is more bloodshed, more kind of oppression by Assad regime, and more uh, opposition to the Assad regime, more violent sort of stuff uh, committed by rebel soldiers and Kurdish people. We need to stop that, right? CEO asks, why is, is it bad to have Assad regime and uh, Russian control? Like, it, it is bad. It, it, is, it is a regime that continues oppression and massacre against Kurdish people and all the rebel soldiers. It is likely to continue because the incentive of Assad regime to in, like, recover the uh, land to the fullest extent instead of 60%, right? We think that is a likely scenario under Bessie, which is just intolerable. And secondly, I'm going to talk to you about what kind of vision we should have okay. in order to reconstruct um, uh, the situation, uh, stabilize the situation in Syria, right? But again, we don't have to show you, no, thank you, that we want to completely win against Assad regime. But the thing is, America now, in the, at the moment, is successfully like, like acting a role as a deterrence. What can you mean by this? There might be small battles, right? We agree that on our side of the house. But the thing is, like, at least the, uh, other actors like Assad regime, other actors like Russia and so forth, they don't want to have a massive sort of full operation because they know that they can stand a little chance, right? Uh, stand a little chance against the like, United States soldiers, United States operation actually in there, right? That's exactly the thing that is like, maintaining the situation and maintaining the stability at least at the bottom line in those nations. We think it's important uh, because like, solidating its power, in, or, uh, for example, for Kurdish people in certain region and waiting until that region becomes solidated and stable, it's something that we should pursue. Instead of like, allowing Assad to try to take over the full land with full operation of massacre and all of the operations that would continue under their side, we go for separation, we go for stability, we go for deterrence on our side of the house. So that's why we impose this motion.